So, good. Let's do it. So this is an example of a question that one might ask about a diesel cycle, thermodynamic diesel cycle uh, type engine. Cool. An ideal diesel cycle with air as the working fluid. Air doesn't have to be the working fluid, but it often is. The convenience of combustion. Uh, has a compression ratio of 18. This number is higher than the previous compression ratio. Uh, and a cutoff ratio of two. So I've introduced a new term, cutoff ratio. We'll need to know what that means. At the beginning of the compression process, the working fluid is 101 kilopascals, so atmospheric nominally, uh, 26 degrees C, and we've got an engine size. So the cylinder is almost a two litre cylinder in and of itself, so this is a large diesel machine. Don't just think cars, but that's fine. Utilising cold air assumption, determine. Pressure and temperature at the end of each process. Uh, the network output and thermal efficiency and the mean effective pressure of the cycle. I didn't mention, I didn't talk about what mean effective pressure was for the auto cycle. I should cover it here. Um, it's the same, but we should still cover it. So that's the type of question that we're answering. They are all reasonable questions. Uh, we could also ask, what's the second law efficiency of the cycle? Um, what's the highest temperature? That'd be something you'd want to know for material purposes, uh, for some of your design. The high, well, the peak pressure would determine your cylinder design. Right, so that would tie into your mechanics kind of stuff. Um, these are quite thermodynamic outputs, so we'll go there. So, I'll say similar to an auto cycle and then talk about the differences. And that assumes that you paid attention when we talked about the auto cycle. So, we'll see. Mechanically similar, same sort of thing. So you've got a, a cylinder that's compressing and expanding. Uh, you've got valves that are controlling the, the air in and out. Um, camshaft is your mechanical actuation for your valves. Uh, the important different feature is that the compression now is above the auto ignition temperature of the fuel. Right? So in the auto cycle, we recognized that you got more efficient the higher your compression ratio. So the solution would seem to be, well, just jack your compression ratio through the roof. But we found that You've got uh, something that happens with the petrol called auto-ignition, where just by virtue of pushing it, the temperature rises to the point where it <clears throat> uh, will ignite and potentially ignite as you're trying to compress it, and you'll get engine knock and so forth. So now we've got a cycle that we're compressing above the auto-ignition temperature of the fuel. So you can't have the fuel in the gas stream on the way in. Because uh, if you had the fuel in the gas stream on the way in, as soon as you reached the auto ignition temperature nominally, right, there'll be some local variances, but um, let's just treat everything as quasi-static. As soon as you reach that, then it would ignite. So you can't do that. So instead, you inject into the cylinder rather, in, rather than into the air intake. Okay, so you don't have a spark plug going into the cylinder, but you do have fuel injection going into your cylinder. So you complete your compression. Good, you've compressed a lot, okay? But it's hot, high pressure. And then you inject a spurt of fuel in, and as you inject it, it reaches the, it touches the hot, uh, the hot high pressure air and ignites. And this is why, for a spark, we assume that a spark occurs instantaneously and propagates instantaneously. For a fuel injection, we assume that the injection takes place over a process of time, and so that changes the way that we analyze the cycle. So, it's, so that's what I mean, it's the exact opposite of what you're thinking. So we assume a spark happens instantaneously. It doesn't, but it's a good assumption to make. You've got to assume something. The assumption we make for the diesel cycle is that the injection occurs at a constant pressure. So it's an isobaric process instead of an isochoric process. A constant pressure process rather than a constant volume process. So things that are the same, the cycle is air, air standard. So we assume the composition to the air doesn't change. Um, heat addition is isobaric rather than isochoric, um, which I've put that anyway. And combustion is modeled as a slower way of adding heat. So rather than instantaneous, it's slower. So there are differences. Um, this is an example of a car that uses a diesel cycle. Um, 
I chose it. I chose a Prado because my dad bought a Prado, so I thought I should look at it. The re oh, I want to go back to real life object for a few reasons, but one of the main reasons is your assignment calls on you to analyze a real world device and then analyze the device thermodynamically and compare the results. And hopefully that spec will be out um, today. That's certainly my, my intention. So we use the same, a lot of the words are the same. All right? Things that we were always already introduced to with the auto cycle. We introduce a new term, the cutoff ratio. And so we'll talk about what that means. But this is the kind of data that you might get. Um, displacement, so it's a 2.75 litre engine. Uh, by the time you take bore and stroke, does it have how many cylinders? You could calculate how many cylinders by knowing the volume of each, the swept volume of each cylinder and dividing 2.75 by that number. Um, compression ratio of 15.6, that's actually on the lower side for a diesel engine. You can certainly get up um, to 20 uh, or higher. And again, you've got power outputs and torque outputs at specified RPMs. So these are values that you can compare your, um, the, the calculation of the cycle with what the manufacturer says the device produces. So that data is available. Um, so what does the process look like? There's, so in the idealized sense, so we have to think ideal first, reversible adiabatic compression, same as the auto cycle. So you take in some air and you compress it. Reversible and adiabatic, so no heat transfer, um, no turbulence and so forth, so it's a, it's a simplification. Now, isobaric heat addition, so not isochoric heat addition, um, but rather as the cylinder is expanding, you're injecting heat in, this, uh, in the form of combusting fuel into it so the pressure is retained at that higher pressure, at that top pressure. Uh, then after you've done all of that, you've got reversible adiabatic expansion. And so the cylinder continues to expand the rest of the way to the bottom dead center volume. Uh, and it produces work through that process. You've got hot, high pressure gas. Uh, and then what we model is isochoric heat rejection, which is really the opening of the exhaust valve. So immediately or very, very quickly to immediately, the pressure drops back down to atmospheric pressure a little bit above as it forces the gas out. Um, and then you've got exhaust and intake. As in an ideal sense, the exhaust and the intake are modeled as isobaric, so the pressure doesn't change, and you're sweeping across a known volume, so whatever work you have to put in to get the intake in, you... Sorry, whatever work you have to expend with the exhaust, you get back in the intake. In reality, Obviously, to force the air to go out, you need it to be slightly higher than atmospheric. And unless you use a turbocharged or supercharged engine to get the air to intake, you need to be lower than atmospheric because that's how you make fluids travel. Um, so you do lose some energy through that process. Ideally, it's isobaric, um, but it's one of the considerations uh, for your analysis of the real system. And then the other question is, what is the pressure in the cylinder after the intake. So I've said 101.325, but that's not true. Like it's not there long enough and your intake uh, manifold, the, the pipes going to the cylinder aren't large enough for the air to freely travel in. So it's gonna be something less than atmospheric. Um, just things to think about. So what does that look like? It looks very similar to our spark ignition auto cycle. Uh, the difference here is Injecting fuel in. Oop. Pen stopped working, that's fine. The difference is injecting fuel in. Right, so now we're injecting fuel rather than igniting a spark, and we're modeling that as isobaric rather than isochoric. This is what it looks like in a PV diagram and a TS diagram. Okay, so uh, so with the same cycle points as the auto cycle. Um, so we've come down here from point one, we've gone up to point two. Now, remember that with the auto cycle, point three was then a vertical line from point two to point three. Here it's a horizontal line because the process takes place at a constant pressure rather than taking place at a constant volume. So it's slightly different, 
and that has an effect on our efficiency and on our analysis. So we need to take those into consideration. And of course, the changes in entropy and temperature as well. When we do um, the Rankine cycle, which is only a few weeks away, we'll basically only deal in the TS domain. So we won't be thinking about pressures and specific volumes, we'll be thinking about temperatures and entropies. Um, so we're, I want to show them both because now you might feel more comfortable about pressures and specific volumes. We're moving more to the right as we get more mature in our understanding of cycles. Uh, this is Reissel's take on the same diagrams, so same thing. This one to one dash line at the bottom is reminding you that there's an exhaust and an intake stroke um, that has to happen as well. So cutoff ratio was a term we needed to define. So if, you, if the pressure doesn't change, so what we defined in, uh, in our auto cycle was our heat addition, Q, uh, or maybe our pressure, the pressure added at the top of the cycle. If our pressure doesn't change, then we need something to define for us the length of this line. And so that becomes our cutoff ratio. So specific volume three or volume three, depending if you're um, which one you calculated, divided by volume two. So volume at state point three divided by volume at state point two. And this is representative of how long you're injecting the diesel for. So the longer this line, the longer, the more diesel you're injecting for the cycle, the shorter the line, um, the less you're doing. Calculations, and this is what I mean. So I, I probably use these terms, and for me, it takes no cognitive load to use these words. For you, depending on how much attention you paid, this might be a really busy slide. And so according to what I learned on the weekend, maybe I should change it. So anyway, I'll learn how to teach better as we go. Um, so using our, our first law for thermodynamic, for a thermodynamic process for a closed system, we've got Q minus W equals M times some things. One of the tutors was talking to me uh, and basically they, they said that some of the students in their class are simplifying the first law of thermodynamics incorrectly for the situation they're dealing with. So it's worth knowing, it's appeared that my pen has stopped working. Does anyone use a surface and could lend me a pen for, a, for the rest of the lecture? Thank you. Is that going <coughs> to... She is. Well, maybe it's a battery thing. Aha! Thank you. That one's mine. This one's yours. Excellent. I appreciate that. All right. So, Q minus W equals delta U is only true for closed systems, and it's only true if you can neglect velocity and potential energy. So if you're dealing with an open system, so something that's got mass flow coming in and out of it, okay, then that's no longer true. So it's just worth taking into account. So what are the simplifications and when are they appropriate? You need to kind of have a sense for that. Um, so it's good feedback. I appreciate feedback from the demonstrators and the things they see in class. So there's four processes, three are the same as the auto cycle. Reversible compression, reversible expansion, isochronic heat, heat rejection. Okay, what's missing from this list is process two to three. And those things for a closed system ideally all look like the equations on the right. So it's CV times the difference in temperatures. So what do we do with our isobaric heat addition? Right? Well, our first law um, for closed systems would say Q minus W equals delta U. The thing to note with an isochoric heat addition was we said the volume doesn't change. For isobaric, the volume is changing while the process is being undertaken. So both Q and W are non-zero values. So we, we can't just take one or the other one out. So what do we do? We put the work over on the right-hand side. Because it's isobaric, work is just equal to P times the difference in volumes, which is good. And we have a term that means 
internal energy plus PV and it's enthalpy. And for an ideal gas, change in enthalpy, so dH equals CPDV, uh, CPDT. Okay? And so we'll find that, so the CP is in red to kind of flag it with you, and so we'll find that um, these that are the same as the auto cycle all use CVs. Sorry to be more distinct about it. These all use CVs. You're like, why do you want a pen? You're no good with it anyway. These all use CVs, and this process will use the CP value for the gas because there's work being done across the process. So that's, from an analysis perspective, that's the difference, and that's where it comes from. Uh, now, what's the thermal efficiency? It, knowing nothing else about the cycle, um, we can do a similar analysis as what we did with our auto cycle, and we can put that in terms of compression ratio and cutoff ratio, and we get this equation, where R is our compression ratio, so volumetric compression ratio, and R subscript C is our cutoff ratio. In case you had forgotten, if I do that, okay, that's the auto cycle efficiency calculation. The diesel cycle, with its new RC term, introduces some stuff off to the right-hand side. Just intuitively, would a large cutoff ratio or a small cutoff ratio, so the cutoff ratio is bounded to be at least one, because volume, volume three divided by volume two is it's a division, so it's going to be at least one, right? And I guess it could be equal to the compression ratio. So you could have your RC is bounded in an upper limit to be R because you can't inject diesel for longer than it takes for the cylinder to reach bottom dead centre. Intuitively, is a small RC or a large RC, so an RC closer to 1 or closer to R, better based on this formula? And I can't see it based on that formula, just so you know. But I want you to think about it. Longer RC, shorter RC. Good. Appreciate your thoughts. No, no, as in, I, appreciate, I literally appreciate that you, you are thinking. I, I do appreciate that. So the answer is an RC close to 1 is the best. If you, if RC limits to 1, because it can't equal 1, because then you get 0 divided by 0, which is just ugly. But as RC limits to 1, this whole term limits to 1, and you approach the, uh, you approach the efficiency of an auto cycle. And that's, so like from the formula, it's not, it's not intuitive at all, but that is always greater than 1, but as RC goes towards 1, it limits towards 1, and so your thermal efficiency for an auto cycle is always greater than the thermal efficiency for a diesel cycle for a given compression ratio, right? For the same compression ratio. But someone said diesel cycles have a higher thermal efficiency and I gave them a chocolate. So what, is, what property of the diesel engine lets us be more thermally efficient than the auto, even though I've just said it's not? Higher compression ratio, right? So for a given compression ratio, the diesel is less efficient than the auto, but getting around this auto ignition problem lets us, so we can take like the, the compression ratio of a car, might be, so a petrol car might be eight, the compression ratio for a diesel engine might be 19, right? So we've significantly increased our compression ratio, um, and that means our overall thermal efficiency will be higher. Uh, even though RC is not one. So that's where that comes from. Higher compression ratios and they achieve higher thermal efficiencies in practice. A few comments. So decreases with increasing cutoff ratio, but you need to some cutoff ratio because you need to inject some fuel. A cutoff ratio of one implies you inject no 
fuel into the cycle. So obviously that, um, you can't do that for long. This is certainly true, we're, we're getting around it with more improved technologies, but certainly turbos, uh, you would almost say turbos are a standard, God bless you. Turbos are a standard on diesel engines, whereas with petrol cars, you might have them. Right? With petrol cars, the problem with the turbo is that you're increasing the pressure and temperature, potentially, in the cylinder. And for petrol cars, that's a problem. For diesel, that's not a problem. In fact, it's desirable. And so, you know, we were putting turbos and diesels earlier and more commonly and certainly... Um, I'd say it's tough to buy a diesel car without a turbo. Someone contradict me? There you go. Yeah, you get, you don't get the performance. Um, and I had a 2007 <laughs> European made, what, Ford Focus in the diesel. They were doing, no, that was punchy. It was nice. Um, I had come off a motorbike. That's a different story. But anyway, literally come off, wrote the, wrote the bike off. Um, and I thought, ah, the Focus has is, is got a reasonable. Cool. Talk about thermodynamics. So let's answer then a question. Right, analyze a cycle. So what have we got? We're given a cutoff ratio. A problem you're going to have with your assignment for the auto cycle and for the diesel cycle, if you choose those devices, is uh, not, the, not the compression ratio. That's listed. That's easy to find. Right? What's the cutoff ratio or what's the how much fuel is burnt in each cycle? So just to, you know. Heads up, that's something you'll need to work out, intuit, calculate. An ideal diesel cycle there is a working fluid. Compression of 18, cutoff ratio 2. We're given a volume, utilize the cold air assumption, so we're going to say that all the properties for air are as they are at 300 Kelvin. Determine pressure and temperature at the end of each process, network and mean effective pressure. So that's our, that's our goals. I, I talked about having a cycle solution path. So does anyone remember what the first thing we do if we're presented with a problem is? What do you do? Table? Good. Draw up a table. Put in the known values. Good. I've just listed the things that we know um, there. So the things that we know are in the top right-hand corner and table of values. So things we were given was the incoming pressure and temperature, and we were given the volume and the compression ratio. And from the compression ratio, I can calculate. So this is the volume at bottom dead center. Then it's compressed. So that's whatever the, oh, there you go. Here's the calculations. That's whatever the volume is divided by the compression ratio. And then I have a cutoff ratio, and so I've got a definition for cutoff ratio here. And so that gives me my volume for three, and then at the bottom of the power stroke, you must be back to the volume that you begin with at the um, beginning of your compression stroke. So that hopefully looks reasonable. I don't think I've done anything with the calculations that can't be followed. Um, finding the pressure and temperature of state two and state three. So pressure can be calculated. Right, so this is just PV to the K equals PV to the K. One, one, two, two. Right, so it's a rearranging of that formula taken P or V2 across the other side and K is a common uh, indice. Okay, so that will give us P3. Oh, so that will give us P2, I apologise. And it's isobaric between 2 and 3. And so that would be P3. So, so I guess something to note is in a question... Sorry, I'll get there, I'll get there. Ah. What this doesn't say is what all the processes are. It just says diesel cycle. Was that the slide I was on? Good. So 
the assumption that will be made of you is that if I say diesel cycle, you know what all the processes are. This one's compression, isentropic compression, this one's uh, isobaric expansion, so forth. So you will need to be aware of um, that. That's true also of, for example, the Rankine or the Brayton cycle. I'll say air goes into a turbine with an efficiency. We need to talk about turbine efficiency as well. Air goes into a turbine, you need to know what does a turbine do? Where's the work? What happens to the entropy? You know, what's going on? Um, for auto and diesel, I don't give you a schematic. I just assume you know what, what a four-stroke cylinder engine looks like. Um, good temperature. Temperature two can be calculated. This is, um, this is the combined gas law, PV on T equals PV on T. One, 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 two, two, two. Right, rearrange, so that, let's just calculate temperature two. And then the question is, well, what would temperature three need to be to maintain the same pressure? Uh, and I've done that using the PV equals MRT formula, but you could also do it using PV on T equals PV on T, I think. So you could say, well, the pressures are the same, so for an increase in volume, I need a corresponding increase in temperature. So the increase in volume is double, so the temperature must be double. How's that go? Double that is that? Yeah, that's easy. So we're just working out, we're just filling out the table using formulas that we know. Uh, we're filling out the table and then state point four. So now we're going through a isentropic expansion process. And for isentropic expansion, again, this is PV to the power of K equals PV to the power of K. And I guess PV on T equals PV on T would be fine there too. So I'm using uh, the polytropic expansion and compression formula and the combined gas law to give me my pressures and temperatures at the four state points. If you don't feel confident with that style of calculation, not, not if you don't feel confident following me doing it, but if you don't feel confident you doing it, that's something you'd need to um, get familiar with and confident with, I would suggest. Um, and I would suggest that there's a difference in looking at me and going, I agree with those calculations, than being given a problem raw without any guidance and you doing it. So, what were the, um, I've left the table there, the, um, whether you've got the calculations or not, they're in the, they're in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so the, the three questions in the, um, in the question specification were, what are the pressure and temperature at the end of each process? So for that, it's straight off the table and that's not an un unusual outcome to be desired from this sort of process. What are the pressure and temperature at the end of each process? I've written as per the table, you would write that out. The network and thermal efficiency, sorry for the small writing. Network output and thermal efficiency. Let's start with network output. Network is the summation of your work out and your work in. It's, all the, it's the sum of all the works that happen, okay? So there's three processes that have work. There's the isentropic compression, there's the isobaric expansion, and there's the isen Tropic expansion, so they're the three processes that have work. Uh, one of them is isobaric, for which the work formula is relatively trivial. Uh, and then the other two are isentropic, for which the work formula is less trivial but is a result of integral. We've seen that before for a closed process. Uh, we've got the P's and the V's and we know K, so all of that comes out to be 607 kilojoules per kilogram. Because for a closed system, Q minus W equals delta U. And because for a closed cycle, the cyclic integral, so after you've done the whole cycle once, the cyclic integral of any property must be equal to zero. Right? And this is where you have to pay attention to what your simplifications are and when's appropriate to use them. Then the net heat is net work. And we've talked about that before. So an alternative way to do this calculation is take Q in plus Q out, all right? And there's only two processes that use Q, where heat 
that are not adiabatic, if you like. One is the isobaric expansion, and the other is the uh, isochoric heat rejection. In my opinion, the formulas for those two processes are easier than the formulas for the work. Right? So they're, they're faster calculations. Right? And I've said one, but it's 1.005. I've got a problem with real estate um, when I try and show the calculations side by side. Um, and we get 607 kilojoules per kilogram. The truncation error is mine. Um, but we find that by analyzing heat flow in and out of the system, so heat's a right-hand equation, uh, we get the same answer as if we followed the work through the system and often, and often in truth, like measuring the pressure in the cylinder is harder than measuring how much heat you put into the, the process through combustion, right? It's a simpler process. So often we will track heat and not work because the calculations are simpler, the measurements are simpler, and you get the same answer at the end. Would this, does this answer the question? So they're equivalent. Uh, is that considered a, an acceptable answer to the question? The answer is no, but what have I forgotten? Not, not thermal efficiency, but is this the network output of the system? If not, why not? It's per kilogram. Good. So you were given the cylinder size, so it was 1,900 uh, cubic centimetres. If you're not given the cylinder size, if you're not given the extent of the system, then a lowercase specific work is sufficient for you to answer a question. If you're given the volume or the mass flow rate or you know, some measure of extent, then you should give the answer in extensive terms, in complete terms. So because we're given the, uh, the volume of the system, we can calculate the mass of the air at the beginning using the ideal gas formula. We find the cylinder holds two 0.2 grams of air, and so we times our, our two solutions to get our extensive work. So this is every time this cycle occurs, and the cycle occurs once every two revolutions of the shaft, you get 1.3 kilojoules of energy, right? And if we want more power, what would we do? So we've got a fixed amount of energy per cycle. If we wanted more power, we would increase the RPM. Do it more often. Um, and that works up to a point. It stops working after a point uh, for reasons that are less thermodynamic and more mechanical. Um, so we won't go there. Cool. So some of them are thermodynamic. You just, you can't, anyway, maintain constant pressure, but a lot of them are related to valve bounce and some of the mechanical aspects of the system, forces due to acceleration and so forth. If we're asked for the thermal efficiency, there's a few different ways we could do it. One is what I think is the simplest definition of efficiency, but not necessarily the simplest calculation. Efficiency is what you want divided by what you had to put in to get it, 63%. We could also remember that efficiency for a heat engine is 1 minus Q out divided by Q in, um, which is something we've covered before, 63%. Or we could have remembered or been given the equation for the thermal efficiency of a diesel cycle, and you get the same thing. So if you're given the specs on a diesel engine and just ask for the thermal efficiency, an ideal diesel cycle, just ask for the thermal efficiency, you could theoretically just go straight to the number, knowing only compression ratio and cutoff ratio, and not calculate the cycle. In reality, you'll almost always calculate state points in the cycle and, and get to it from there. But I just want to show you there's agreement between the figures. Um, once again, truncation error is mine. Um, that's there. Any questions on the analysis, the cycle? I want to just do one more quick thing before we go. No? Good. Excellent. Uh, sorry, mean effective pressure for the cycle. So this is, the mean effective pressure is what the pressure would have to be if the pressure was held constant during the power stroke. 
So while the, um, while the cylinder was expanding with the hot uh, high pressure gas behind it, mean effective pressure would be what would that pressure have to be? That mean, that average pressure, right? Which is the work coming out of the cycle divided by the swept volume. And I could have done this on an um, extensive basis because we have the extent, so that could be W net divided by V max minus V min. You understand that if we divide the top and bottom both by mass, then we get the same answer. Um, and I've already got my specific volumes calculated. And so the mean effective pressure for the power stroke would be 750 kPa. Would be the equivalent pressure, right? Rather than going from 5.7 megapascals down to 250 kilopascals over a curve, if you could hold that constant, that would be the mean effective pressure. It's just a way of comparing different engines. Um, and so it's a term that comes up. So you should be aware of it. We won't do this, but hopefully you know something more now. And hopefully having done auto and then done diesel and, and done the comparison, um, hopefully you feel more confident with your understanding of engines. Um, there's more we could say. I want to do the dual cycle, which is just like a series of comments. And then that's the lecture. Any questions about the diesel cycle? No? Excellent. Good. Dual cycle then. It's going to take a few minutes. So the dual cycle comes about because, in truth, the ignition process is neither isochoric nor isobaric, but is somewhere in between. Right? And so the idea is that we could match our real life cycle more accurately if we kind of modeled, well, some of it's going to be isochoric and some's going to be isobaric. Um, in reality, maybe there's a curve or maybe there's a, a spike and up. But if we just uh, take these two, um, then we can get better agreement between our analysis and our real cycle. So, uh, it's not an auto, it's not a diesel, it's a, it's a mathematical construction of the both of them to try and get closer to an internal combustion engine. So a portion is isochoric and the rest is isobaric. So that's, I guess, a way of talking about it. There's five processes. So a thermal cycle doesn't have, thermodynamic cycle doesn't have to be four processes. This one's five. Uh, it's not unusual to get to eight or nine uh, in, in the ranking, which is where we're going in a few weeks' time. So you compress, you add heat isochorically, you add heat isobarically, then you expand. And just to keep the numbering the same as the auto and the diesel, rather than introduce another number and then the rest of the numbers are out of order, they've just put in a, a letter so that um, stroke four, you know, uh, process four and five, state point four and one are the same. That's what it looks like on the PV and TS charts. The analysis, is very similar to, that's the analysis for heat addition in the auto cycle, and that's the analysis for heat and work in the diesel cycle. So I've just taken those terms from the two cycles and mashed them together into this cycle. Make sure you feel familiar with and comfortable and confident with those. Uh, we then need another term to be added, and that term is, well, how much of the heat is isochoric and how much is isobaric, right? So we need a cutoff ratio because a cutoff ratio tells us what the volume ratio is that's the isobaric part, but now we need to know what the heat was. And so we define that as the pressure increase that occurs in the isochoric sense. So that's alpha. And lo and behold, and you know, I'm not going through the math, but we then get, again, a thermal efficiency based only on compression ratio R, cutoff ratio RC, and uh, I forget what the term alpha is called. Sorry, I didn't write it down. The term alpha. So <laughs> just using those as variables, we can calculate the... Um, 
Thermal efficiency, it's somewhere between the auto cycle and the diesel cycle. Question, high values of alpha or low values of alpha? So adding most of the heat here or adding most of the heat there will give you higher efficiency. What do you think? What does your gut tell you? That's right. Adding most of the heat in this, if all of the heat was added on the vertical, then it would be most like the auto cycle, which has a higher thermal efficiency. If all of the heat was added across the horizontal, it would be most like the diesel cycle, which has a lower thermal efficiency for the same compression ratio. Okay? So a higher value of alpha will give you a higher thermal efficiency. Um, that would prove to be true if you graph that. We weren't going to analyze one, but I just wanted to introduce the idea that a thermal cycle doesn't have to have four processes, and that the cycles we learn and think about can be modified to better suit our real world situations. That was that. Tomorrow I think I want to do um, gas turbine power generation engine, so Brayton cycle. Um, so come back for that. It'll be a hoot. Any questions, comments, my consultations after? Great. Thanks, guys. I'll see you tomorrow afternoon.